Hi, good evening. My name is Mia Bays and I am the director at large of Bird's Eye View. And we are a mission, we are a not for profit mission to bring ever greater audiences to films by women um, in the UK. And we have networks in 15 cities. We see ourselves as cultural activists. And uh, we are we see films are as being by women um, when they're about the female perspective. So it's about who tells the story, not who's in the frame. So the name of our mission is called Reclaim the Frame. And um, welcome back to those of you who are um, avid followers. We really appreciate the support. And for those of you who are new, um, welcome. And you can find out more about us on Bird's Eye View. Um, .co.uk and I'm delighted to welcome from Santiago, Chile, Maita Alberti, who's the director of the beautiful and heartwarming The Mole Agent. It's one of the most unusual documentaries I've ever seen and I think you have such a beautiful filmmaking style and we were just talking about how we see some of your films, your other films now. Um, we'll come back to that. So Maite, welcome. Thank you, Mia. Thank you very much. So lovely to see you. Um, so basically, we will talk for a bit um, specifically about this new release from Dogwoof. Um, the film is out now. Um, I'm also welcoming, actually, um, a number of cinemas are also streaming this live. So cinemas that are now closed, but that would have been showing the film on the big screen and hopefully we'll come back to it, I'm sure. Um, but you can see it online um, at um, the moleagent.co.uk and actually if you click on the virtual theatrical tab on the on the website you can actually um, stream it via a cinema and the cinema actually can get some of the profits of the film which is a really fabulous I think new way that during the pandemic we've all figured out ways to help cinemas when they're closed to help cinemas participate you know in in revenue sharing and so it's a wonderful thing to plug so shout out to all the cinemas that are also um, supporting this film. So, Maita, you have a degree in aesthetics, audio, visual direction, and social communication, which I think is kind of fabulous. So, I wanted to start. I wanted to start with, and actually, your films. This is your sixth film. Is that correct? My fourth film. I have four feature. Four feature. Four feature. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And you've made two shorts. Yeah. And so, and you're as a director, you're you are really hailed as one of my significant voices in Latin American documentaries and I particularly see why, um, especially with this movie. And so your first film was The Lifeguard and your last film was called The Grown Up. So I think we'll talk a little bit about that, but we're focusing specifically on the mole agent. So before we get into how you made the film and where this extraordinary story came from, how you unearthed it, I'd love to hear how you obviously you studied film to a degree but how did you actually discover film did it did it find you or did you find film did you always know you wanted to work in film no i think that i i didn't uh, know what i wanted to do really like i i i first studied aesthetic by an interest in art in general um I I thought that I want to be film criticism first. Okay. And then in the university I realized that cinema have a lot of things that were of my interest area and study. I discovered that documentary was the field that I feel more comfortable as an excuse to know the world with the camera. And I think that, that that's the way that my interest starts, but it was not like I want to be a filmmaker and I want to make documentaries. It, it has been a discovering road. Mm -hmm. Got it. Wonderful. Thank you. So the mole agent. So that it's such an incredibly moving film, and it's a cleanness and what we do with the elderly, not just in Chile, but this is something that happens all over the world, which is to put them in care homes and often forget them and they're out of sight and out of mind and and the way that you center you know a, a, a kind of very wonderful and diverse group of people who are more over 80 is it's just so wonderful to just only see people of age aged people on screen so how how did it start how how did you find this story it's amazing it starts for a completely different place, I think. It okay. starts for the idea of make a 
film about a private detective. I wanted to make a film noir because in Chile there is a, a film noir documentary. It's because I thought that the private detective were usually territory of fiction. So I think I thought, okay, I want to make a private detective in documentary because the, in Chile there were a lot of, of private detective agencies. Uh, so I wanted to understand why the people were hiring a private detective. So I, I researched in all the private detective agencies until I met Romulo, that it's the private detective of the film. That was the only one that allowed me to work with him for a while and to make a research inside. And I, I work as his assistant for a couple of months. And I see different cases of moles. And at the beginning, I wanted to make a TV series with each mole per episode. But it was so difficult to plan how to shoot it without kill Romulo's mission with my camera that a lot of episodes was impossible. And when I saw one case of retirement home, I thought, okay, this case is a case that I can shoot by my own uh, without kill his mission, entering for another place with my camera, with my uh, lie or my excuse and he can enter for his side. So, uh, and it was a kind of place that was comfortable for me to shoot. So, uh, of course, that the question was at the beginning, I realized that his job as a private detective was very similar to my job as a documentary filmmaker, because I spent a lot of time waiting with the camera until I press rec to have the scene. And I feel that when I make followings with him, we spend a lot of time following people until he has the proof or he pressed the camera for record, for take the picture. So uh, it was not so weird for me to be observing this world. And, and the private and the retirement home was also a case that allows me to speak about another things. But yeah, I wanted to say like Sergio was was not in the project at the beginning neither. He usually worked with a mole agent uh, that three weeks before start shooting he broke his hip. So that's why Romulo has the idea to put the ad in the newspaper, and that's why uh, that's how Sergio appears. That really uh, in the newspaper, and I thought like this n nobody's going to came and 50 people arrived to the interview, and I really cannot believe it. And I I got in love with Sergio as soon as I saw him, and was my candidate, not the perfect candidate for Romulo, so I, I really begged Romulo to hire Sergio. Uh, I knew that was, I know that it, it was the worst spy in the world, but but he was so honest and so tender from the beginning and so connected that we really, try to convince him as soon as we saw him. Oh, that's really interesting to hear. I mean, I can see why Sergio is just absolutely to die for. And everyone in the home who he's supposed to be investigating falls in love with him yeah. too. I mean, it's ordinary charisma that he has. I mean, let's come back to Sergio. Um, so, so obviously it's complicated because you're filming in a home where you can't reveal what's what you're filming really so you obviously had to lie so tell us about how you went about getting access into the home under false pretenses yeah it was a big little lie uh, i make a film that it's called tea time about a group of elderly women that we shot it for many years this woman having tea and it was super well known in Chile and and the people of the retirement home, the owners loved the wow. film. Wow. So I went to the retirement home and I say like, I, my producer called first and she realizes that they know me from tea time. So it was more easy to enter and we say that I wanted to make a film about old age and about how to live in a retirement home. And I wanted to shoot for months everything that is happening here, the good things and the bad things. And if someone new arrived, I want to focus in the process of a new person. And usually 
once per month some someone new came uh, sorry came for a test or for or three days or to stay so uh they allows us to shoot and everybody uh, signed the release of course that we didn't say like we are going to shoot a mole and um, first we shoot the training of sergio and and we say to sergio that inside the retirement home he has to act that we don't know each other from before so after the training i entered to shoot the retirement home two weeks or three two almost three weeks before Sergio enters. So we were already there when Sergio arrives. So they get used to us in a way and we were shooting everybody. Uh, so when Sergio arrives, he was the new one, but he was another character of the, all of we were shooting. So that's how we enter. And at the beginning, I didn't feel guilty to make the lie because I thought that really, bad something bad was happening but in the meantime when i realized that it was a good place i started to feel really bad uh, and it was super difficult to decide in which moment say the truth to the owners and to the director of the retirement home and at the end i decided to tell the truth when the film was finished when we have the final cut we invite them to see the film in a screening room. They were our first audience. And then I say the truth. I say like, okay, we lied to you. Sergio was a mole. And this is the film about. And the most surprising thing for me was they say that they never suspect. And I really, I not understand how they never suspect if Sergio was really all the day speaking with open boys, with Romulo and and yeah it was not the the best spy in the world um and they see the they saw the film and they cry and they get really connected and they love it and now they promote it a lot and that is a big relief for me because i really don't know how can i be now promoting the film knowing that they hate it or they feel that we like we like but <laughs> at the end it's a film that that represent their life anyway, yeah. And so you were filming for, you You had a very small crew, I understand. So do, so you film personally, and then you had how many other people? Because that, that must have been quite complicated. Yeah, actually. I worked with the, with the camera person, the sound uh, person, uh, and pro assistant producer and me. Uh, and our techniques, it's like we we shoot a lot of days. Like we shoot like 100 days, like all week, all days. So we really, I, I knew what kind of things he were uh, researching because Romulo uh, put like, as I knew before, uh, which like, uh, things Romulo asked for the previous case that I saw, I knew from before which kind of things he were going to ask to Sergio inside. So in some way I were prepared with the research that he has to make. So I knew what things he's going to ask. But at the same time, we spent so many time there that we knew the rhythm and the things that were happening. So we wait until we we shoot the scene. For example, before that, Romulo asked to Sergio to investigate the the person that was stealing. I already knew that Marta was the one that steal things because I saw her uh, many days doing that, and it was a comment between the nurses. So I already knew how to shoot her before that. Romulo asked that kind of things to her. So. As we really know and enter to that world and we start to know it, we know what to expect and how to move inside. And then I mean, obviously you didn't know how it was gonna turn out. It could have been it could have been bad. Um, and you could so so there's a point where you have to just be confident that you're gonna find the film in some way, right? So how did you just how did you know just to keep filming and was there at what point did you really know 
what the story was even but did it change at all i think that this the, the first film that i realized that i have a film the last day of shooting i think it was completely i usually work with very long process and long researches and with this one it was always like a risky fear like the first day that sergio arrives he wanted to go back home because mm -hmm. he was afraid of became another uh, person with dementia in that world and a world and he started to freak out and he started to call her daughter i i cannot uh, shoot that because it was the first day and i were more like focusing everybody and not in him but like each day was like okay he's going to be discovered he's going to regret he's going so i never really knew if i can finish this film uh I think we we started to to get more financing very very in advance because I really didn't know what I was selling, and and yeah, I think that I realized that I have a film uh, very late, but and at the same time, I realized during the editing what kind of films I have because I was shooting my private detective research without seeing the emotional process from Sergio. Uh, and for example, the scene when Rubira is crying and he said to her, like, please cry, like be free of yeah. cry. In that moment when I was shooting, it was like, okay, like here is something happening that it's not the mission and the emotion is in another place. So I have to change and move to this other place. But it was not in my first idea and for example i shoot a lot the client and the calls from the client to romulo and when the client arrived to the office and even sergio speaking at the end with the client and in the editing it was like i don't care about what is the problem with the client and why she's researching i am more committed with what is happening to sergio inside so that is something that I discover uh, really in the editing and at the end of the shooting. Like that is the the change of focus that Sergio given to me as a gift, I think, but I was not conscious about that before. Mm -hmm. And what were the biggest challenges in the edit? Because obviously you had, you had I understand 300 hours of material and then you also had Sergio's spy cameras. So yeah. what was the biggest challenge in terms of mapping mapping it out and finding the film in the edit? Yeah, I'm very used to work with a lot of material in the editing. Right. I think that for me, the most challenging thing was to assume that my previous idea was not the point of view of the film. Like why yeah. the people is researching or why to hire a private detective, it was not important really. Uh, and another important decision for me in the editing was for example to show ourselves as a crew that was something that was not planning when we shoot it indeed we have to try to find in sergio's cameras and in our camera where we appear because we didn't shoot it thinking on that if i thought on that i will appear more i think or, or in a better way but we realized that, that as we were showing the film, a lot of people were asking like, but it's true, that's really happening. And it was like, yeah, this happened and it's true. So in some point we have to explain briefly how we're doing and we were there, the people are conscious about the camera. So then you can enter to the story and don't be asking yourself which this film is. And this is a co-production be between five countries. So the rough cut when we shared the rough cut with all the countries it was like um a united nation meeting like each country have an opinion and all of them have the opinion that okay but in the documentary field world everybody's going to be asking why how like and each producer have different um opinions to how to resolve it and, and at the end, they were super open of the way that I find to resolve it. But it was a, a question constantly between the producers that I am very grateful from them that they really helped in this process. But it was something that I find in the editing, how to put it. 
And what were the emotional challenges? Because it feels like there must have been emotional challenges, you know, while you were making this film, while you were actually shooting. And because you're you're in, in what to one level, you know, you're trying to keep Sergio there because he was obviously feeling sad and wanting to go. You know, without him, you've not got a film, right? So, so, and also, you're obviously you're filming really kind of beautiful and quite painful moments as well. So, it must have impacted on you. But what? How did how did that feel? That experience? Yeah, I think that uh, I'm used like when you film, when you shoot films, and you spend a lot of time with people that reality starts to be your reality. And um, I don't know, tea time I shoot it for five years and I lost characters in the process. The grown up I shoot it for one year old days, here was the same. So their experience is your experience and their pain start to be your pains. Mm -hmm. And I, yeah, it, for me, it's super difficult to, to put that distance because I feel that Sergio experience was also my journey and my experience and my feelings like i think that i really share the feeling of sergio and and i learned the same things that she learned i think in, in a way like i started with the same prejudge of the place and of the people and for example soil and marta the, the characters with alzheimer that they want to go out all the time as the first time i also thought like okay they are crazy they are crazy for, for sergio they were like okay they are completely crazy and nowadays, like, they're the kind of people that I want to spend all the day with them. Like, I really have funny moments and they are really touching for me, but spending time with them. So I think that the gift of Sergio, it's like when you spend time with people, you can see people and really, like, see identities that you don't see if you don't have time. And I really enjoy to be with them and, and I really suffer uh, with their pains. So, um, yeah, I, I think that they are super like my, like the Sergio's learning is my learning too. So let's talk about Sergio because he's just such a remarkable man and, and it's just so beautiful when we see him so deeply moved by the experience that he has there in the home too. So can you talk, what was it like showing him the film for the first time? What's been the, what's been the impact on him and his life? I think that until now, for me, like Sergio really don't distinguish the film that the, of the experience. Like when you ask questions to him about the film, he always goes to his, experience and put scenes that are not in the film like uh for him until now i think it's not a film it's like the job that he has to do and and yeah in, in like once we present the film together and he uh, speak and he talk all the film and he spoiler all the film and he had like yeah for him it's like he really don't understand like um yeah, what is the documentary, what is the film, even if we explain it to him until now, it's it's complicated. He loves it and, and now he has super good friends, like um, he say like it's time that he's not calling, like his phone start uh, ringing and, and he has to go to visit. Now he cannot go because we are locked down for, for a while, but he usually went back and once per week he called them and he's the one that updating me about how are they and yeah they they for him they it was a super important experience and she makes really good friends he makes so and what did it teach you about um you know what we do um in certain countries it's the same for us here in in the uk that you know there are like for instance during covid and the whole pandemic you know people in care homes have been disproportionately affected um because they were sort of the last to be protected in many ways so and so what did what did you did you find it shocking i mean you know on one level it's shocking that someone suspects that that uh, her mother in the care home is being abused 
when she doesn't really herself go there. So there's so much drive of, of guilt driving what, what she does by hiring a detective. But and so what did it teach you about about the people on the outside as well and, and their loved ones and what and about the people on the inside and and this wonderful range of older people? Yeah, I think that I really no details of the client case that are not on the film and they have a lot of family problems and they had they was forbidden to enter because she make a big mistake like she has a lot of family problems that was that was why she didn't go to visit but at the end yeah it's guilty and it's guilty to put your parents in um in a retirement home but i think that in chile at least and in the world in general, like retirement homes are still seeing like the old people doesn't want to live in a retirement home because it's the way like to die in life. Like it's the worst thing that can happen to you. It's to go to a retirement home. But there are also places that we need and uh, not only for people that it's dependent, like there are a lot of old people that are, it's better to live in a retirement home than in their homes, but I think that uh, we always think that the retirement homes are bad here, but the problem is that we didn't make bridge between society and retirement homes. So we we put all the responsibility in the taking care of the retirement home, but as family and society, we don't integrate them in, in family life, even if they are living in retirement homes, like why they are not going back home on Saturdays or Sunday or why they really don't participate in community staff or cultural staff like uh, or activities like when they are in retirement homes like they close they close doors like the the image of Marta trying to escape it's like she she's trying to escape to another place that didn't exist but it's a metaphor for me of the others. Like they are really with the doors closed there and they are really not making communication with outside. And I think that uh, today with the COVID, like of course that the um, retirement homes are more in the media than they were not before. And when I finished the film, I. I, and I premiered on Sundance, I say all the time, like, call your parents, call your grandparents. And now I don't have to say that because I think that people during pandemic started to call others and started to call parents and grandparents. But the point is like the owner of the retirement home told me all the time, like my life didn't, or the life of the residents here in the pandemic didn't change so much because during the lockdown, because the funerals here were without a lot of funerals and I have to shoot funerals without family members, only with the nurses and the people they're organizing. Or uh, we didn't have visitors of some people that did hear from years. So like now they start calling after many years without calling. So I think that uh, like, yeah, something uh, change, but it changed for the one that were outside, not from the one that were living inside. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, picking up on that point, one of the questions from the audience is that um, some of the residents are in their seventies, yet they've been there for twenty-five years, meaning they moved in very young. They moved in in their fifties, and this. Is this is this that feels much much more unusual? Is this something specific to Chile? I mean, is that a cultural phenomenon, and and why might that happen? Why might someone live for so long? Yeah, I think it's there. really cultural of the of the place that it's a retirement home located that is a small town near Santiago. That when the like uh, Berta that say that I arrived when I was sixty years old and I had been here for twenty five years. Oh, she was a single woman in this small uh, town and when their parents died she decided that, that she wants to live in the retirement home and she started to live there very independent but with other people like to don't be alone and a lot of women single women went to live 
they're very young and they stay, they stay, they stay for years. But it's, yeah, it's super specific of that small town. And and what did the experience teach you? What what? How did it change you and, and your life making this movie? I think that a lot of things maybe that I already say, like, like to be more, like to have time to don't, to be more tolerant and until especially that we were, well, uh, we live a very difficult political period that we have opinions like are super radical and we fight a lot with our opinions and we never find point, point of encounters. And I think that with the characters of the film that when I, when I, the first time that I know them, I didn't find point of encounters and taking the time, I don't know if you're going to feel the same way to the other, but you're going to understand a lot of things of that world that only the observation of the experience can open your eyes. Like when you read the things, when you read the theory, and I can say, like I read before that in Chile, the most highest rate of suicides are of old people over than 80 years old because they feel alone. I, I read that a lot. And everybody knows that, but I didn't feel it really before to see, to make the film. And now I really understand what that is happening, what that is happening. And in that place also, like two years before a, a person commits suicide because uh, he feels super alone. So uh, it completely opened my eyes to that kind of numbers that were only numbers. So I feel that the to see the experience from inside really connect you with that theories um and yeah i learned also that you cannot make an, a statement about old age like i we usually speak about old age or elderly people and i think that making the film i realized that there are so many lives possible at that age like the film start with people that it's fi trying to find a job at this 80, another one that wants to get married, another one that has Alzheimer, another one that is missing his child, like a lot of different situations that uh, you can reach at the same age. So uh, yeah, I feel that we cannot make like group statements in general. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what's also really rather beautiful is is the effort that the care workers and the people who work there go to 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 kind of impact the lives of the residents the that I was thinking particularly of the when they phone and I'm not sure how I feel about it but when they they pretend to be her mother because she has dementia and so so yeah can you talk a little bit more about what did it change your view of of people who do that kind of job what are your thoughts on on what they did there for example yeah completely i think that i so so much love in that place and so much yeah. taking care of people but at the same time even if they do everything they are never going to replace the family love that or the family situation that they need like even if they make the job well like they need another things also and at the same time it's like and they can make mistakes too it's mm -hmm. like i saw also problems like one of people fall and then the family complains because the woman fall but it's something that can also happen in my home with my small mm -hmm. kid that he can mm -hmm. fall and it's of course that it's my fault but that kind of things happens in place mm -hmm. and but we only from Outside, we only see the bad things that are happening sometimes because you don't see the whole experience or the day by day experience. You see like some actions, and yeah, and we prejudge about a um, like yeah about from more small actions. I think yes, yes. And so, what's been the impact? When did the film come out in Chile, and what's what's the impact like? What's it what's it what's it been like? Yeah, it was a super difficult year because, well, for everybody, but here the the, tea, the cinemas never open. So we make a virtual release that was going super well. And I realized that, that a lot of people that never see documentaries before came to this film and see the film. That was really great to be more democratic and transversal in the in the audience. 
and with the industry works super well it was selected by the chilean academy to represent uh chile at the oscar so it's the it's the candidate for yeah thank you for international uh film for foreign film um so we are making that campaign also the the documentary campaign so uh yeah it has very very good uh we had very good feedback and at the same time i'm really proud that here in the industry they speak about the it's a documentary but they take it as a film and and it's the first time that i'm more discussing about the topic that in my previous film was more like it's real it's not real what is fiction what is not fiction like i don't know if it's the social art our burns i don't know how i this the protest that having we have in chile one year ago that people really start more thinking in in the society that we are and trying to understand us and also the pandemic that we are trying to understand more society and everybody's more focused in the message of the films now uh, and and that it was also uh, surprising that in Chile, more people are seeing local films than before, and we think that it's because of the of the social changes and the elections that we are trying to understand us and films. It's something that helped for that. That's wonderful to hear, Marta, and congratulations. Thanks. And but you you did manage to go to the, the was the world premiere at Sundance. So you were yeah, you at Sundance? It was before so everything. So I have it was a gift. I, I have the opportunity to see the film with audience. Yeah. And was that the that was the world premiere? That was the first screen, yeah. was it? Was the Amazing. First. Yeah. Amazing. So and how was it showing it in America? What's been the difference between the Chilean um reception and and, and international responses? Is there any really different? it's a film that works very similar in different parts it was right. completely a emotional traveling and the people laughed and they get touched and i think that that is a good thing for me about the co-production like all the producers help a lot to make the film more universal and not so local and to hear different voices uh help me to make the questions during the editing process and i and i love that of the co-productions like not because there it's not it's not the most comfortable way to finance the co-production but it's the best way for me to learn how the film it's going to work in different parts and to hear other voices yeah and why did you have did you have to have five co-production partners because that was just how you finance the movie or like how that because it sounds complicated and it's quite unusual actually yeah it was complicated but at the same time all the producers that we have of, of the film it's people that i really admire and we really wanted to work with him with them so yeah at some point that the, we really have like the budget but at the same time it was like okay we we want to work with these people and the film is going to have more distribution and indeed in this context that it's super difficult this year to have distribution the film was released in the five countries so that is never will happen if we were not have the co-production before like in this context of pandemic will be very difficult to do that um there's a few questions from the audience so one um is did you feel a special connection to the theme of loneliness and the importance of companionship in old age, because that comes through very strongly in the film. Yeah, I started to realize that it was a very important issue. And as I said, like to be the rate of people committing suicide after 80 years old, it was like, okay, this is the topic and this is what is really happening here. Mm -hmm. uh, another question from the audience How long did it take in the edit to get the perfect balance of the incredible emotional connection and the, also the comedy? Like for instance, he runs around to get in front, the moment he runs around to get in front of the target or when he breaks the glasses, which, and all of those were just so beautifully real and funny. How did you find that balance in the edit? Yeah, I think that we have that balance in the life experience in that place. Like 
I the other day the sound person, the sound man that worked with us told me like it was weird because I only have like funny moments in my mind and I cry so so in the film, but in my memories I, I laughed a lot all the time and I didn't cry during shootings. If I, and in my remembering, like I cry a lot. And I only also laughed a lot, so I I think it was that that experience. And I I try to make that in documentaries also because I I feel that life is like that. You can be like living a very hard period, but you also can laugh, and and you cannot be in one tone only. And I think that that place have that balance, and it was something that we really take care on the editing and probably to yeah there is more funny things at the beginning and less at the end and then you start you start losing the balance but yeah it's because you start understanding what is happening and in some point like you have a pain but it's kind of moving in that that pain but yeah i think it's black and white all the time in that place mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and so what's it been like trying to work and release a film this year? Because Chile, you were just talking before we went live about your lockdown has been really tough and really long. So just tell tell the audience a little bit about how long you've been locked down and, and how, how do you work? What's it been like? Yeah, we have been locked down like for seven months, like a strict lockdown, only with one permission uh, per week or two permissions per week, two hours, but you have to take with the police. Like it's not easy to move now. Uh, we are not look like we have a couple of months without lockdown, but now we are locked down again. And yeah, it has been really to don't go out from home. Like uh, we don't have any freedom. So yeah, it, it was difficult to understand how to release a film in this context. But at the same time, the people were more connected to films because we we really cannot do anything. Like we cannot go to the park, we cannot go to the street. So uh, we have more audience in some situations than than in another context. But yeah, it was to to quit to the possibility of the big screen that as a director you you always want that feedback. Uh, and at the same time, yeah, it's I, I learn a lot about the feedback on the screening room, and yeah, I, I am trying to understand another kind of of feedback. But yeah, we don't have the opportunities to see the film with with audience here, like in present in physical. Yeah, you've been working on a lot of um, international releases as well, like the UK, like the, the film's just out this week. So is What's that? I mean, in a way, that's been great because at least you can do things like this and you can connect to other territories, but you can't be there physically. So you, but where you would have traveled much more with your previous films, I presume. That is completely great. So it's, it's terrible, but it's great because mm -hmm. I was already tiring up to be in all, like travel to festivals. Like it's really like, you don't know in, <laughs> in some point where you are and and you are like um yeah uh going to different parts of the world but you cannot go to every festival so you cannot be connected with all the audience and you cannot be premier in all the places and now i really can be speaking in all the uh premieres and to have feedback of different territories and that has been uh super great yeah mm -hmm. And and then and how have you found working? Are you working on another film? What's what's what have been the sort of positives and negatives of trying to find another your know, follow up film? How has that worked for you in these conditions? Yeah, it's super for documentary filmmaking. is super difficult because we cannot put protocols COVID for the characters. And I was shooting a film that I had stopped shooting because I cannot put put in risk my character because he has an illness so yeah it's very difficult for, for me to shoot we send a camera to them like they, they start shooting themselves and we have super good material but but yeah it has been like to change to see new ways to shoot uh but for me it's difficult because i never make interviews i always shoot with passing time with characters so in some point I quit to shooting until I can shoot again in the way that I love to shoot. And 
and I don't not get inspiration uh, alone in my office. Like my inspiration is seeing the world and researching the world. If I I I shoot domestic things, so uh, I I shoot micro world. So the micro world of my home, of course, that it can be possible, but I I don't care about my own world. Uh, so yeah, it's I think I, I'm not going to continue. Uh, creating really until I cannot be on the field yeah and you mentioned your style there and it, like you that you don't do interviews so, like, how did you develop your style and, and what's important about it observation like I, I pass a lot of time researching before to shoot and I know really well the places and I I know like the behavior of the places before to go like knowing what I really want to to take of this world and I spend a lot of time with people shooting so I should process and I should change this in life and for that I need time and I need to be there like observing not to go and, and catch one thing or one moment it's like a construction of time passes in small places uh, with a deep observation of the, that places so if I cannot be there it's like it's not information that the characters can give me by Zoom in an interview. It's like, okay, it can be the first approach, but then I really need to be there. Um, and it's very difficult. Like we we make all the research that we can do by Zoom, but there is a point that you really need to be there. Mm -hmm. And and who inspires you? What other filmmakers, what other kinds of work do you love? Not just necessarily film. What 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 other art forms inspire you too? I, I, yeah, I. There are so many artists that inspire me. Like I am super, I am super big consumer of of art. And well, but like documentaries inspire me all the time. Like like the freedom in the style. Like this year, I don't know. I love collective. I love Dick Johnson is dead. I love the travel counters. Tchaikovsky yep. uh, in general. Um, yeah, like I think that uh, the good things it I, I has been seeing a lot of good films. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And there's another question from the audience. Uh, your film, The Grown Ups, which is about a group of adults with Down syndrome who want to be treated as independent grown up individuals, was again a film that shone a light and gave agency to the unseen and a voice to the voiceless. In this film, The Mole Agent, you literally give a man who has no agency a job as an agent and he comes alive. What is it that draws you to this kind of subject? Um, yeah, I, I realized it like a couple of weeks ago that the grown-ups have a lot of similar, a lot of parallels with The Mole Agent. In, they're completely different, but it's, it's exactly that. In the grown-ups are people, old people with Down syndrome that they have been in the same school for many years. They are 40 years old and they really want to be independent and they cannot. And, and as they are dependent, they are put in an institution and they are completely out of the world. And it's the same, like there are institutions that exist for people that depend of others and they cannot be in society because they depend of others. So. If you are not independent, you cannot be connected or you cannot be part of society. And I think that in both worlds and the grown-ups I hear, I see small societies with all the characters that you can see in a society. And for me, it was super normal place. And I can live in both of their like very happy all the time, but they're like parallel, so small parallel societies. So for me, it's the same. Like. Uh, Sergio is a bridge in some way uh, from society to that world and and he goes and he came back and and yeah it's the question of both films can how can we have these institutions because we need them but at the same time how to integrate them without isolate them like without put the people that we don't uh, want to integrate day by day to society in another place I think films can change people's attitudes and can change the world, not always um, obviously, but sometimes covertly. Do you, do you think that your 
is that your purpose that you're changing whether it's one person's view or or at least starting a conversation in within your culture or other cultures do you can you talk a little bit about do you see yourself as a as an activist in in some way yeah i i i don't want to think that i'm that i i don't feel myself as an activist but i think that from my field i can put questions in in people's minds and i can put topics in the media agenda and now like here in chile we were discussing a lot about retirement homes and old people and i speak a lot about that and when we release the grown-ups we we make a outreach campaign and we change the law here about wow. yeah there there was an article in the um, in the job law that say that people with down syndrome can have less than the minimum salary even if they work the same of the wow. the same hours of other in the same job so that was something that we changed like with that campaign with a lot of foundations that we were but the film was something that helped with the experience of the characters it was the same that i was saying about the suicide rates like you read the article and you know that it's unfair but you need to see that reality so when the foundations put their articles and put the examples of the film that were super well. So alone, I am not going to do anything, but the films can be um, um, instrument to yeah. others to help to change things. And, and that is something that I really want to do. Like I make a lot of Q and A's in medical staff okay. or with psychiatrics and people that really can change the world more concrete than me. But yeah, the film is an instrument for them, I think. Yep. And has that happened with the mole agent? Have you worked with foundations and charities? Is there in, are there any ongoing campaigns people are using the film? We are not making campaigns, but we are go we are making a lot of Q and A with the right. the the section of the government that it's in charge of all people uh, with uh, medical institutions, and yeah, we are we are working with specialists in that areas. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. And and do you stay in touch with everyone from the home and for, and with Sergio particularly? Yeah, I saw Sergio uh, like two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. and that was great. Um, before the lock, the, the new lockdown, and yeah, I, I spoke with them, like with the owner of the place and with Sergio. Yeah, constantly. Yeah. And how is Sergio? What's how how has his life changed? radically like he was like a super active man that he was all the time like doing things like he's getting crazy without go out like he's very hating this right yes but has he become famous i mean i guess it's probably quite hard to become famous when no, everyone's locked down like, uh, like when he started to go out and he used the mask he told me like a lot of people recognize me with the mask like i cannot i i don't want to know what is happening if I go out without the mask, but as he doesn't go out so much, like he can, mm -hmm. he don't realize really how famous he is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And just one more question, Marta. Um, do you what what would you like people watching it? You know, where we're obviously talking about the UK release, and you know, is there a particular thing that people watching it you'd like them to go and do afterwards? Do you think about that, like whether it's kind of you know. A personal thing a personal action you know do you think about that and what you want the audience to do in follow-up i think it's the first the same thing at sundance like i feel like i don't want to think that all the people that abandon their parents in retirement homes are because they are bad people it's only mm -hmm. because the rhythm of life sometimes really doesn't give you time to take the time to go and see the others so it's much like how can we make a small daily things to connect with others it can be a message like a photo, daily photo like a daily small uh, call phone um like my i'm going to say a very stupid thing my my mom uh, she passed away and she has a she had a sister with down syndrome and her wow. sister uh, all the days call her at 10 p.m after she see the news to say 
what is going to be the weather next day? Like, and she called all night and she said, like, 10 and 30 degrees, bye. Like, it was like, okay, and we were like, okay, Francis is calling to you to tell the weather, like, she was like, okay. but that's all like a 30 second call, but was her connection and her presence, and in some way, I feel that sometimes we only need that. Like when I say it, to build a bridge, it's like, that can be a bridge. Like I only mm -hmm. send up daily, daily photo and that's enough. It's like mm -hmm. to feel presence, even if you cannot be in physical presence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's wonderful. And so do you know what you're doing next? You've had to abandon this, this current film. So are you just waiting for everything to return to normal? Yeah, I'm editing the material that I had of the film okay. that I was shooting, and I'm trying to reach the way to to make something with that and adding another material. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Oh, it's been such a pleasure to talk to you, it, and it's such a beautiful film. It really is. So for those people watching who haven't seen the film, um, yeah, go and watch it. There's multiple platforms showing it or if you pl click on the virtual theatrical release um, on the moleagent.co.uk, you can also see it through a cinema and the cinema can benefit. Um, so we wish you such luck with this film and getting an Oscar nomination. I hope we go all the way, you deserve it and, right. and more. And yes, have a wonderful Christmas. And yeah, we're here, we're, we want to bring as big an audience as we can to this. So yeah, we will do what we can. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night. Good night.